All right, so I'm going to share some thoughts on increasing interactivity in physics TV programs. The model that you can pour knowledge into students' brains is not a model that works. This is well substantiated by cognitive research now. So teaching by telling does not work. Much of what students hear is lost in real time. It just bounces off the walls and the rest may just stay in students' notebooks. It is clear now that students must construct their own understanding. They should process the information themselves. And this means that we have to give students an opportunity to reconstruct, extend, and organize their knowledge. And this can only happen if students are actively engaged in the learning process. Before we talk about how we can actually get students actively engaged even in a TV program, one more thing that I wanted to make clear is what understanding means. As Bloom pointed out long time ago, there are different levels of cognitive achievement ranging from knowledge all the way to evaluation. And knowledge, according to Bloom, just means having, a rote, having some rote knowledge of something. So for example, students might know that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with time, and this may just be rote knowledge. So if an instructor asks students to be able to calculate what would be the acceleration, average acceleration for the case where a car was moving at 60 miles an hour north, and then it started moving at 30 miles an hour west, and this change happened over a period of seven seconds, and, and the students were asked, what is the average acceleration in this period, students may not be able to do it if they just have rote knowledge, but not understanding beyond that. Of course, we have to make it very clear in our instruction what our goals and objectives are and what level of understanding we desire. And this should be made clear even in a TV program. And we need to be able to share these goals and objectives with students so that they know what they should be able to do at the end of a particular module. And it's true that the instruction will be successful if we align our instructional modules with what students know when they go through these modules, and if we have some means of assessing what students have been able to learn from these modules. And I'll talk a little bit about how we can assess that let me give you an example of Newton's third law. So it turns out Newton's third law is one of the fundamental laws of physics, which is very intriguing. It says that whenever an object exerts a force on another object, the other object must exert a force which is equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. Now, just by knowing this law in this form, it is not easy for students to figure out what are the different contexts in which this law is applicable? And it is true that this law is applicable in a very wide range of contexts, but unless students are given an opportunity to think about it themselves and process this information, it's going to be very difficult for them to internalize Newton's third law. So one way to help them internalize Newton's third law would be to give them an, exa would be to give them an example even in the context of a TV program where they might have to key in the correct answer in a, in a question which is given to them in a multiple choice format and they have to send it by their mobile phone. So look at this question here. It says a big trailer truck moving at 100 kilometers an hour collides head on with a small car which is moving at a 50 kilometer per hour speed in the opposite direction. Which of the following statements is correct? Choice one says, the force that the trailer truck exerts on the small car is larger than the force that the small car exerts on the trailer truck. Choice B says, the force that the trailer truck exerts on the small car is smaller than the force that the small car exerts on the trailer truck. The third one says, they exert equal forces on each other. And the last one says, there's not enough information to decide. The correct answer here is C from Newton's third law, which says the forces must be equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. But students often have these misconceptions that 
in this context, since the big car is moving at a high, higher speed, or that because the big car is, the big trailer truck is actually heavier, it must actually exert a larger force on the smaller car. And oftentimes these difficulties might be even due to the differences in different uh, physical variables. So it's true that the acceleration of the smaller car will be much larger than the acceleration of the big trailer truck because Newton's second law says that net force is mass times acceleration. So acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. So even if the forces are equal on the trailer truck and the small car, they will have different accelerations and the small car might get thrown off the curb because it has a very large acceleration if its mass is very small compared to the trailer truck, even if they are feeling the same force. But students may get confused between these concepts of acceleration and force, and they may actually not see the applicability of Newton's third law in this context un unless they are given an opportunity to actually think about whether Newton's third law is applicable here, applicable here or not, and they are giving, given other examples as well. So just like what I was saying, there are many, there are very few physics principles, but they are applicable in so many diverse situations that students need to be able to give, need to be given opportunity to think about these concepts in diverse situations so that they are able to go beyond the surface features of the problem and see that the same concept is applicable in all these cases. And they are able to decontextualize things and think about the con concepts more at more abstract level. So let me give you two more examples in which the context seems to be different, but the same concept of physics, the same principle of physics is applicable in both cases. So here is a problem of an ice skater who's spinning on essentially fr frictionless ice with her arms extended, and then she pulls her arms close to her body. There's no external forces or torques on her. Which one of the following statements is correctly describing the effect of pulling her arms in? She, she slows down and her angular momentum decreases. She speeds up and her angular momentum increases. Due to the conservation of angular momentum, her angular speed is unchanged. She speeds up, but her angular momentum is unchanged. She slows down, but her angular momentum is unchanged. So in this case, the correct answer is D. She speeds up, but her angular momentum is unchanged. But again, it may be difficult for students to answer this question unless they understand the difference between angular momentum and angular speed. The other thing is, if the same question is asked in another context, so here is a, another context which says, a spinning neutron star collapses under its own gravitational force and its radius decreases. There are no external forces or torques on the neutron star. Which one of the following statement correctly describes the effect of the collapse of the star on its angular speed and angular momentum. And the choices are exactly the same as in the previous case. It's so the question is, are students able to see that regardless of the fact that it's a, it's a spinning skater in one case and neutron star in the other case, the underlying concept of physics is the same in both cases. It's the conservation of angular momentum. And the reason for this is that there are no external torques acting on these systems. So they are isolated systems in which there is no external torques. And that's what makes them systems in which the angular momentum is conserved. And based upon that, you can actually infer that if the moment of inertia is decreasing because of the collapsing of the star or the ballerina or the skater putting her arms close to herself, the angular speed of these things must increase. But we need to be able to give students these kinds of examples. And again, on a TV, it can be done by asking students to punch in their answers through the, uh, their mobile phone. Uh, I also want to emphasize that it might be a good idea to integrate quantitative and conceptual questions. Because if students are only given quantitative problems to solve, they often treat them as plug and chug exercises and they don't reflect about what they have learned by solving that problem. On the other hand, if they are given only conceptual questions, they often don't even think about what physics law might be applicable in those cases, and they treat them as guessing tasks. On the other hand, 
if conceptual questions are followed, follow quantitative questions, it helps students reflect, uh, reflect upon what they have done just now, and it gives them an opportunity to extend and organize their knowledge. So perhaps there should be some opportunity for us to be able to include both conceptual and quantitative problem solving in these kinds of interactive TV programs. I also want to emphasize the importance of hands-on activity, which can actually provide concrete examples. And these are particularly useful for students who are underprepared in math or formal reasoning. Another good thing about uh, hands-on activities is that they challenge student preconception by providing contradictory experiences. For example, oftentimes if you ask students what would happen if you cover half of a lens, what would happen to the image on the other side if you cover half of a convex lens? Students often say that the image will get cut into half. But of course, that is not correct. What actually does happen is that the intensity of the image will go into half because so long as the light is going through all parts of the object, through all parts of the, and going through all parts of the lens, all parts of the lens is forming the image. And so the, all that will happen is that you're not letting the light go through, the, through half of the lens and the intensity is going to half. So if you give to, to students these kind of exercises where they have to first predict what should happen and then they do these activities or they are shown these activities and they have to think about reconciling the differences between what they predicted and what they saw, that would be very good for their learning. Also, these hands-on activities can motivate students. They can familiarize them with the phenomena that physics explains. And it can also help clarify causal relationships between physical quantities or differences between related concepts. And it also improves physical intuition. I think one way one can actually include hands-on activities in a TV program is again by including lecture demonstration kind of hands-on activities. And perhaps these can again be preceded with some multiple choice questions where students have to think about what should happen in a particular hands-on activity. Then they are shown a particular activity and then they are actually um, asked to think or maybe we think with them, think through with them why a particular physics principle uh, dictates this particular phenomena and guarantees that a certain thing should happen. So for example, a very popular demonstration is a monkey getting killed by a bullet. The question is, if the, if the bullet is pointed exactly at the monkey, at the moment when the bullet is shot and the monkey stays on the branch, and does not move, will the monkey get killed? It turns out that the monkey won't get killed because the bullet will actually follow a projectile path because it's falling down under gravitational acceleration. So it will actually go through a location which is lower than the location of the monkey when it reaches the same horizontal distance where the monkey is. On the other hand, if the monkey lets go of the branch exactly at the same moment that the bullet is shot, then the monkey will get killed because the monkey is falling down under the same gravitational acceleration and the bullet is falling down with the same gravitational acceleration also. And in this case, both of them would have fallen down exactly by the same amount and hence the monkey would get shot. If the students were asked to think about this in the form of a multiple choice question before they actually were shown this experiment, they will have something at stake, they would have actually processed this thing, and they would focus on the concept that is really important for them. Anyway, this is the last slide of what I wanted to discuss. Thank you very much for your time.